Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Joy Lynn, and I'm with DMAI, and I'm joined today by my colleague Jim McCall, as well as Dr. Bill Siegel, founder and CEO, and George Zimmerman, chairman of Longwoods International, to discuss destination marketing and economic development, creating a singular place brand. Welcome, George and Bill, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Glad to be here. Um, just to let everyone on the webinar know, we will be recording the presentation and we'll share this video recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation in about four business day after this live broadcast. If you have any questions during the webinar, please go ahead and send them through the question panel of your GoToMeeting dashboard. Um, my colleague Jim will be monitoring them throughout the hour and serve them up to our panelists at the last 15 minutes of the presentation. Um, so thanks again for joining us, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, George, please take it away. Great, thanks. If you go on to the next slide, we'll get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we um, are happy to have this time, and want to thank DMAI, of course, for uh, allowing to present this today, and also in Austin. Um, also, Schneider Publishing, who helped us with uh, sponsoring our session uh, at the DMAI, D DMAI event in Austin. So today, we've got a couple things we're going to talk about. Um, and First is the case study, which is the uh, Pure Michigan case study. Obviously, I was with Travel Michigan for 12 years during the creation and launch of Pure Michigan, so we'll look at that and see where it's applicable to uh, all of you. Second is this whole idea of how the halo effect of tourism advertising and visitation uh, impacts not just tourism, but economic development objectives and the image of a state or city or region. So that'll, that'll be the second part of what we do. So let's get started on to the next slide, please. And we're going to start with Pure Michigan, um, a, a case study I know and love. And we'll move on to the next slide. So a couple things. One is, you know, whenever I talk about this topic, um, not really here to tell you what might work for you uh, as a destination, a city, a state, a region, whatever it might be, but what happened with Pure Michigan and the result of it. Uh, the other thing is I'm sharing this in about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and it's about a t it was a 10-year time period now. Uh, Pure Michigan turns 10 years uh, next year. Obviously, there were lots of ups and downs and bumps along the way, but uh, uh, it was not a straight line. It'll just seem like it in a 10-minute presentation. Uh, so on to the next. So what you know, what were the, really the keys for Pure Michigan? You know, looking back, these are the things that always kind of stuck out to me as why it worked. Uh, first was the powerful brand message that was created by McCann Detroit that inspired confidence and, and produced results. And so that was kind of the obviously the 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 center of what we were doing uh, with McCann. Uh, the second thing was the, having the data to prove the effectiveness, particularly the ret uh, ROI, return on investment uh, data, that showed how many visitors were being attracted to Michigan, were coming to Michigan because of the campaign, uh, and um, how much they spent and what that meant for the state as far as taxes and ROI. So that was obviously a key factor as well. A third, also a very important factor for us, was the industry uh, leadership and unity behind both the data and the brand. And it was important that they be kind of there for us for with both, both the data and the brand, and, and they certainly were, um, and that is what made it work, and that's why we got the budget increases I'll talk about and that kind of thing. And the last thing I would say is, you know, the key was to have enough money to promote the brand. You know, I mean, we with McCann could have created this great uh, brand messaging, but if there wasn't the, the funding, if that did not come through, and that was largely because of the industry's efforts, then obviously the message would not have been uh, seen, heard as widely as it is. So that, those are kind of the four keys I look at when I look back at my tenure there. So next, please. And here's what we, you know, leading into this, uh, the first few years I was there, we were really in a, in a kind of a tough spot with smaller budgets every year, um, just continued budget declines. Michigan was in the, in the middle of a, by 2005, in the middle of a decade-long recession on its own. Um, and so things were going poorly. The state budget was in terrible shape. Uh, and they were cutting all the budgets, including the, the tourism budget, every year. And so that was, you know, just obviously a, a bad situation. Uh, next, please. And 2005, you know, I always look at it as kind of rock bottom. And that is because we were end, ended up doing less marketing every year because we had less money to work with. Um, the private sector was demoralized, fragmented. Um, it, it was a bleak time. As I mentioned, we were in the middle of this kind of decade-long Michigan-specific recession. Uh, things were just not good. And in fact, we ranked 50th as a state in hotel occupancy. So we were at the bottom. Um, and the only real bright spot was that in 2004, we had commissioned our first ROI study from Longwoods. Um, and we got the results in 2005. 
and they were positive. Even though this was pre-Pure Michigan with our, our former not near as good campaign. Uh, next, please. And so when we got that first data for the old campaign, the old Great Lakes, uh, Great Times campaign, which I'm sure almost no one's ever heard of or remembers um, because it was not that memorable, uh, we spent about $3.5 million on advertising in 2004. Um, it generated almost a million trips to the state. And again, this is the, the number of trips motivated, you know, where the, the advertising influenced the travel. Obviously, there were many, many, many more trips uh, to the state, but this is that subset that is motivated by the advertising. Visitors spent about $164 million at Michigan businesses, uh, and they paid about $11.5 million, 11 million in state taxes. Most of that is sales tax. And so, for the state of Michigan, they got back about three and a quarter, $3.27 uh, in taxes, in that sales tax for each dollar spent on advertising. So it was positive, and it was this data that really got us the budget increase that made Pure Michigan possible. Um, so next slide, please. And so with that budget increase, which went from 5.7 million uh, in 2005 to 13.2 million in 2006, so more than double, we um, hired McCann Detroit, worked with them on this brand creation, um, and launched Pure Michigan. And we're going to play one of the spots right now because I love them. Twenty-five thousand mornings, give or take, is all we humans get. We spend them on treadmills, we spend them in traffic, and if we get lucky, really lucky, it dawns on us to go spend them in a world where a simple sunrise can still be magic. Twenty-five thousand mornings. Make sure some of them are pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. And so with that, um, and, and, and on any of these spots, the Pure Michigan spots, you can watch on the YouTube uh, Pure Michigan channel in HD and, and see them in a much better way than we're doing them today. But they're, they're out there. So next slide, please. Oops. So as you, many of you probably know, so the campaign won a lot of awards um, over its tenure. And that, and that was great. It was always gratifying to be uh, have that, that recognition. Next, please. And one of the highlights for us was when Forbes put us on this list of the 10 best tourism campaigns um, back in 2009. Um, I will say, coincidentally, that, that if Pure Michigan had not started national advertising in 2009, I'm convinced we would not have been on this list because no one, no one outside of our region would have seen it. But we actually did start national advertising in 2009. Uh, next, please. And this is you know, just a, a graphic representation of what was going on with the industry. This is industry email about, again, rallying behind both the brand, but you see also the, the data being mentioned in, these, in this message. And you know, the private sector was very forceful. And again, being, coming from being 50th in um, hotel occupancy rate, um, once Pure Michigan launched and people got a sense of the power of it and the results of it, um, they were very motivated to you know, carry the banner for us to the, to the Capitol, to legislators, uh, to the governor's office, anybody that needed to rally. So they were very effective in doing that. Uh, next, please. And as a result, again, I give the, the industry credit for, for most of this. What happened was, so from that 13.2 million, you see that then there was basically almost a straight line, steady upslope on budget and to the to where Pure Machine is today at 29 million. And you know, like a few bumps along the road, but but mostly pretty steady uh, upward. You know, and, and each year we're doing that we're doing that return on investment research to prove out kind of what happened the previous year, how many new visitors came the previous year because of the advertising, what did they spend, et cetera, et cetera. The 2006 is in red because that's the launch of Pure Michigan. 2009 is in red because, as I mentioned, that was when we started doing national advertising, about a 10 to 13 million dollar per year uh, national cable TV by which we've done every year since 2009. Uh, next, please. And this really goes to this, um, this is where we start talking about kind of the halo effect of all this advertising. So the, the, certainly there was that image boost for Michigan as a destination uh, for potential visitors. And it was across many, many brand attributes. And so the, as the next slide shows, um, we look, when you compare people who had seen the Pure Michigan advertising, and this is a national sample, uh, they're represented in green on this, with those who have not seen Pure Michigan advertising, obviously the people in green have a much higher, strongly agree uh, impression of the state of Michigan for all of these things. And actually, this is a 
distillation of about 60 categories that are con condensed into this group, to these groups. But um, just across the board, people perceive the state much better because of the advertising, which you would expect. Next, please. And so when we look at the results over this, uh, the period uh, 06 to 14, most recent data, 22.4 million out-of-state visitors to Michigan because of pure Michigan advertising. Next, please. And they spent about $6.6 .6 billion at Michigan businesses. And next. And that resulted in almost a half a billion dollars in state taxes, again, primarily sales tax. So during that period, the cumulative ROI is almost $5 per dollar. Uh, so $5 in taxes for each dollar in out-of-state out advertising. Uh, next. And then in 2010, um, we had a governor's race, like many states did, and um, one of the Republican candidates, Rick Snyder, uh, made Pure Michigan a campaign issue. And um, we'd had a Democrat previous governor um, who was termed out, could not run again. And so during this campaign, this candidate, Rick Snyder, says that uh, really Pure Michigan had been underfunded and $25 million should, per year should be the floor. And to me, the, the, the most kind of compelling thing about this was that here he is a Republican candidate kind of praising the work that had happened in the previous administration. I mean, even though we are, didn't view ourselves as tribal Michigan as particularly a partisan part of state government, uh, still it was a Democrat administration. So um, we were all in for this. We thought this was a great thing. Not only were we an issue, but an issue in a positive way where a politician was saying that we should spend more on, on tourism marketing. Uh, next, please. And so when, the t when Snyder's team, he, he won the election, and when, so when governor, came Governor Snyder, uh, they, they went through and kind of looked at, well, so what's going on with, um, with marketing in the state? And we've got, at that time, Michigan actually had two separate marketing campaigns, both fairly high-dollar campaigns. Um, the Pure Michigan campaign was the tourism campaign. And then on the economic development side, they, about 2008 or so, um, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, which was where Travel Michigan was housed as well, launched a separate campaign with a separate agency, which was called the Upper Hand Campaign. Um, and so one of the first things the Snyder team did when they came in and looked at all the data and the results, they basically said, why are we doing two, two brands, two campaigns, two agencies? You know, we really can't afford, that doesn't seem like, you know, a great idea for us. I mean, Procter and Gamble can do that with brands because they have the resources to do it, but the state of Michigan certainly did not. And so here's an example of what the Upper Hand Campaign looked like uh, before it was uh, canceled in 2011. Let's play that spot. Michigan's Dow Corning Corporation is the world leader in the innovative science of silicon. Their know-how now benefits Michigan's growing field of alternative energy. Thanks to financial and business incentives from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, our joint venture, Hemlock Semiconductor, will invest more than a billion dollars to expand its production of hyperpure silicon for solar panels. Now is the time to bring your alternative energy company here, because wherever in the world you compete, Michigan can give you the upper hand. So obviously there was just no crossover at all during those, that period between 08 and, and 2010 uh, as far as logos or imagery or style or anything. I mean, they're just completely separate. Again, two separate agencies running them. So um, in fact, there was a lot of internal competition <laughs> between the agencies and the internal working groups, as you might expect, um, over who was doing better and et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, that got canceled. And so next slide, please. And so now the new, new administration said, we're going to unify everything under Pure Michigan. Uh, the, the slight distinction they made, and looking back, it probably doesn't really matter whether we would have or not, was that they went with the green M you see here on the logo for the building uh, for the kind of business side, and tourism uses the blue stylized M, exactly the same logo otherwise. Um, and next slide, please. But you'll see that even on the business development website, for example, and everything, everything became pure Michigan. Um, no matter, and, gener and at this point, we really were the state's marketing brand for, for everything, for all purposes. Uh, next, please. And so then, you know, we went through a really a brand expansion period, finding new ways to get that brand messaging out. So we sponsored, and this was a paid sponsorship, a NASCAR race, the Pure Michigan 400. Uh, next. Um, this was a deal we had with a Michigan-based water company. They, they, we had many businesses who wanted to affiliate with the brand as it became more powerful. And so they, this was not a paid sponsorship. They just wanted to feature Pure Michigan on their packaging because they figured basically associating with Pure Michigan was good for them. Uh, so our agency helped create the packaging, but they executed it. 
Same with Coca-Cola, exactly the same kind of thing. That Coca-Cola paid for everything on these joint things we did with them. They just wanted to be associated with the brand in Michigan. And then we had Michigan beers um, that used the logo on their labeling, that kind of thing. Next. Um, we did have a paid sponsorship with the Tigers as a good way to reach the TV audience, uh, especially of the um, opposing team, um, so that when we were playing the Yankees, for example, or whatever, we could get to that audience in New York. Agriculture picked it up for their purposes, um, which is obviously a natural kind of fit. And next. Uh, Kroger, very similar. So this is the inside of a Kroger in Michigan, and they, they too were willing to pay for anything that they could do to, to showcase the Michigan agricultural products they had. So they did all, the, you know, our agency would do all the creative work, but they would pay to execute it all. And so these were out throughout uh, Michigan stores. And even some of the nonprofits got into it. We just had a lot of, the, the brand became powerful enough that a lot, that a lot of businesses, nonprofits, organizations, beyond the normal tourism partners that you would, and I'll talk about those in a second, uh, that, that also wanted to be part of this uh, in some way. Next, please. And this is what I think, you know, I, this is kind of the last things that got done before I left was this was something we had worked on for a while and was kind of one of our biggest all marketing victories in a sense because it costs nothing. I mean, the state has to make license plates and Michigan now is going through and changing every standard plate to be a pure Michigan plate. So it's not a vanity plate or a special plate. Eventually, they will all be pure Michigan plates, even the universities, um, university plates and veterans plates and everything, all these specialty plates as well. Um, so, you know, and basically at zero cost to travel Michigan. And then getting the entry signage at the state done also was kind of one of those, you know, markers in the ground that said, we are the state's marketing brand, that pure Michigan is Michigan and vice versa. And next. And we, as I mentioned, we also had uh, tar uh, tourism partners who were very supportive of the effort and kind of, we'd had a partner advertising program before Pure Michigan, but it really took off once Pure Michigan launched in 2006. Next, please. And so if you look in uh, 2000, by 14, we had 44 advertising partners. These were, were tourism-related entities, entities who put up money to have Pure Michigan ads created about them. Um, almost $6 million worth of investment from the private sector by 14. Uh, the range was anything from $20,000 to, to do a, a, a small radio buy in a few markets with us with a Pure Michigan ad about a, maybe even a smaller destination to $500,000 from the partner, which basically bought the partner a chance to be um, part of the national cable TV buy. And so they would get a million dollars worth of cable TV for $500,000. Um, but, but to the consumer, it would be a Pure Michigan ad. It would just happen to be about one place, not a more general ad about the state. And then there you can see the growth from two, from 2002. Next, please. And so here's one of those spots, a partner spot. Inside all of us is a compass, and it always points true north, toward mountains of sand, toward new sights and sensations, toward the true bounty of nature. So let's set our compass for Traverse City and find ourselves magic and the moments of pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. So Traverse City was a national uh, cable TV advertising partner with us. They put up 500,000 per year to do that. And then we would we would place that spot, um, it, we'd, we'd give them basically a million dollars worth of cable placement of that particular spot. <clears throat> and so, you know, they got double their money's worth um, and we got 500,000 more to put into the national campaign. In fact, so in 2014, we had a $13 million national buy. 10 million was from us. 3 million was from six partners who put up 500,000 each. So those six partners you know, expanded the, the buy by a third um, with, their, with their money. And so we were able to buy that much more cable TV. And so this is kind of where we transition to the kind of the second big topic for today, which is, you know, that was the case study and kind of how, how Pure Michigan got to where it is. But the other thing is that we knew all along, and I'm sure many of you also see examples of this uh, in your communities um, around the country, and that is the promotion you do about a place, certainly it attracts visitors, and that's the main reason you do it, and that's the main thing you count or, or try to figure out the return on investment for. But we knew that changing or improving the state's image or a city's image or a region's image w would have other impacts. Now, we didn't really figure, have a way to figure out what they were. Um, but we did see anecdotal things, and here's an example of that. So, you know, in 2012, 
we had started that national advertising in 2009. Prior to that national advertising, the New York market had not been a market at all for Michigan ever. We'd never done anything there, nor had Traverse City really done anything there. But this Bloomberg story popped up in 2012, and it was generated by real estate people in the Traverse City area who were telling Bloomberg that, you know, we're seeing more and more, you know, people buying second homes in the Traverse City area is very common, but they're usually from Chicago or Michigan or Ohio or Indiana or somewhere in the, in the region. What, what generated the story was that all of a sudden there's this new demand from New Yorkers to buy second homes in the Traverse City, Michigan area. And so I can't, so I certainly cannot claim or would not claim that this is 100% pure Michigan. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the national advertising started in 2009 and that three years later this started happening. And um, it, so I think Pure Michigan certainly was one of the factors um, that caused this. And so we, and this it goes to the bigger point, which is we knew that there were other impacts of what we were doing with the state's image with Pure Michigan. We just didn't have a good way to figure out what they were. Uh, next, please. So back to the you know the campaign itself. As far as visitors, you know as we've shown, lots of visitors come in regionally and then nationally, which was a big breakthrough. Another market, by the way, that was great for us nationally was Texas. Again, a market we never had done anything in, um, and might seem you know too distant a market to be a really value, you know valuable market. But because of the particularly being someone who grew up in Dallas, the summer um, warmth, I, I will say, um, you know that, that lots of people like to go north uh, and kind of get out of that warmth for a few weeks. So that's a great market as well. Uh, next, please. And so, it obviously, creates jobs when, especially in the beginning, when the economy in Michigan was not good. Um, and next, and also puts more money on the state treasury. And also, in the, at the beginning, when things were really not going well. Uh, next, please. So that's how we got. That's how Michigan got to this single brand for kind of tourism, economic development, and really for any of the state's objectives. It's you know the way I kind of look at it now. It is the state marketing brand. Um, and we have many partners for that. But we just started scratching the surface of this whole notion of, well, what about other ways that this marketing is affecting uh, what's going on with the image of Michigan? Next, please. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Uh, thank you, George. This is Bill now. Um, OK, so uh, over the years, as somebody who started as an academic in psychology, and studied the halo effect and taught it to undergraduates and graduate students as part of, uh, of psychology courses at places like the University of Michigan, where, uh, where I was, and uh, several other universities. Uh, I had seen the halo effect over the years with good campaigns uh, across a variety of different product categories impacting not only what the message was that was being delivered by the ad, but the image of whatever products across a whole range of, uh, of image dimensions. Next slide, please. Uh, the issue of um, the impact of destination marketing on economic development is something that has been, I think, uh, studied relatively recently. Um, but there was a very important paper not very long ago that uh, DMAI uh, sponsored, and in fact, uh, the foundation for DMAI, which I'm proud to be a board member on, uh, provided some funding to Oxford Economics to do a detailed econometric study that looks at the relationship between destination marketing and economic development through, again, regression modeling, lag effects, et cetera. Next slide, please. And so DMAI supported not only that, there was, in fact, a webinar um, a year ago that uh, looked at destination promotion engine of economic development from Adam Sachs, that great paper. Next, please. And also uh, promoting uh, some really interesting work by uh, another uh, DMAI member um, and an important consultant in the economic development community, uh, Andy Levine. Um, and Andy um, looked at it from his perspective, talking not about a singular brand. In fact, he's expressed some skepticism um, to both George and I and written about why 
perhaps uh, DMOs and EDOs, while they should work together, uh, need separate brands, not the kind of unified brand that George just showed you. Next slide, please. So today what I'd like to do is to present some uh, new research uh, conducted just in the past year that looks at measurement of economic development impact uh, from tourism campaigns. And what we have done, I'm going to show you today, is uh, measure the impact of large-scale advertising effectiveness studies looking at a number of different DMOs. And our goal here is to show not just that there's some impact, but to try and get some insight into the how and the why of what, uh, the synergy that um, uh, George took advantage of in Michigan uh, between destination marketing, tourism campaigns, and economic development by one, awareness and image enhancement, which is standard rule for advertising, but we also uh, looked at uh, what happens if you actually visit the destination. If the advertising works or for other reasons you get exposed to the destination, not through images um, and advertising, but through actual visitation. Next slide. Okay, so um, Recently, as I said, we did large-scale surveys that were conducted online um, for each of uh, nine different destinations in this sample. Uh, we looked at adults 18 plus in their advertising markets. Um, the clients can, showing here consisted of seven U.S. states and uh, two CBBs. Uh, because we were looking at uh, the impact on economic development image, uh, we excluded state residents and only looked at non-residents for this analysis. And uh, we looked at the um, image lift created by tourism ad awareness and again visiting the destination. And on the next piece of this chart, you'll see the samples for and the list of uh, the different destinations that uh, we measured. This was just the first round of studies that were going into the field but, uh, with clients who, and I thank them all for giving us permission to share the results I'm about to show you. Um, and what we did was, uh, in addition to measuring uh, their ad campaigns, uh, looking at tourism ROI, image lift, and et cetera, uh, we added some very specific questions. The sample size, as you can see here, was quite huge, 18,638 interviews across uh, these destinations. Next. As part of the research, uh, after we collected in a um, neutral mask situation where people didn't know that it was necessarily Michigan or Wisconsin or North Carolina or, in, or Portland or any of these other nine. Uh, we got information on the trips they had taken um, and uh, image for uh, competitive destinations, um, including both tourism image and some new questions, which I'm about to show you, which I have to thank George for, by the way, after he joined Longwoods, and he'd been a client for many years with the standard uh, image and ROI research that we were doing to get at ad effectiveness. It was his idea to add very specific measures that channeled into economic development. And in order to get there, we actually showed people, because it was online, um, the ads in each client's campaign. Thank you. Okay, so uh, first slide. Now what we're doing is looking at the impact of the first client. And I'll take a, a little longer with the first one and then zip through the other ones because it's the pattern I want you to see and the magnitude of the impact. Uh, so on this one, the green bars are those people who saw the campaign. This one happens to be um, uh, something like what you saw that 
before that George showed on tourism image, only now we're looking at Michigan, we're looking at national here, and we're looking at the state's economic development image. Green bars, people who saw the campaign, saw Pure Michigan, read they were unaware of the campaign, um, and the base was national out of state residents. We also looked at regional for Michigan and showed the similar pattern. And so here are the six new image dimensions, which look like, um, with your presentation, are getting truncated on the slide. Uh, sorry about that. But it was a good place to live, good place to start a career, good place uh, to uh, go to college, um, good place to purchase a um, retirement uh, home, a good place, a vacation home rather, and a good place to retire. Uh, sorry, the uh, third one was a, a good place to start a business. And uh, if you look at uh, the lifts, um, and this is based on the percentage of people who strongly agreed with each of these statements, strongly agreed that Michigan was a good place to live, start a career, etc. Uh, the lifts went as high as 100% on a place to purchase a vacation home, but in every case, uh, we're not talking about the standard research jargon of plus or minus 3% 19 times out of 20. These lifts are enormous. Next slide, please. So that was pure Michigan. Um, here's another, whoops, back please. There's North Dakota legendary. Um, and uh, North Dakota had very strong interest in attracting uh, workers. Maybe things have slowed down uh, there because of what's happened with shale and oil prices. Um, but uh, North Dakota is being in a situation where attracting workers has been a major problem. And again, you can see the lifts are going as high as 100% and that they're uniform across all of these different attributes. Next. Travel Wisconsin, same pattern. Next. Ohio, again, very consistent. Next. Uh, North Carolina, uh, showing lifts across everything. You might wonder why they're not as large in terms of the impact as uh, the others that I've shown you so far. And what you can see here is that uh, North Carolina has an extremely positive image in comparison to um, some of the other states already. And so while we're getting certainly very significant lifts as high as uh, 41%, uh, we're running into a bit of a ceiling effect. Uh, there's only so much uh, agreement that you can get. Next. And there's Minnesota with, again, some pretty large lifts and very consistent. Next. Ah, New Mexico, true. There's a good one. They only recently in the past few years have put any money into um, advertising. And uh, uh, they hired um, actually a package goods uh, marketer, Monique Jacobson, to be the travel director, and she revolutionized what was happening from a marketing effort and also uniting her industry because despite the fact, and I've been to New Mexico uh, a number of times, um, it's one of my favorite places uh, to visit. It's got culture, scenery, all kinds of wonderful things going on there. Uh, their problem, and the research showed it, was that nobody knew unless they had visited. And so we're getting, we're starting with a low base, but look at the kind of lifts they are getting. And when you see, and you can go online and check out the New Mexico True Campaign, it may be the next Pure Michigan in terms of an emotional wallop, and it's showing up in terms of the research next. So that's the states. Um, here was the first CVB that we had the opportunity to measure. We'll be doing a lot more uh, this fall. Um, and there's Portland, Oregon. Um, 
again, huge lifts, um, and in this case going up to 129% for a good place to purchase a vacation home. And finally, on this set of slides coming up is a little one that maybe you haven't heard of, uh, Lake Erie Shores and Islands. It's a regional CDB, and again, um, nice product on the lake and um, a very pretty place, but no awareness. And they got a campaign going out there, and look at the kind of lifts they generated, up to 169% on a good place to start a career. And that's out of a tourism campaign. Next slide. Okay, so what you have seen, um, again, just to summarize, is uh, a uniform um, set of lists for nine different destination campaigns that I showed you, um, covering a range of uh, DMOs, and uh, looking at the impact of tourism advertising. Now, what about visitation? Next slide. And there's Michigan National, and it's showing visitation is, is larger, larger in terms of impact, as you might expect, and just seeing some ads, but um, huge lifts if um, you can actually motivate people uh, to come to Michigan. Um, next. It also says, by the way, it's not all image, that the product has to be there in terms of satisfying the consumers who you motivate to come. If you don't have the product, uh, then you're not going to get that kind of lift from visitation. Uh, there's North Dakota, uh, and again, some uh, they're starting from a low base, and uh, there's quite significant lift by visiting all the way up to 78% for starting a business next. And Wisconsin, uh, same kinds of... Uh, uh, lifts uh, going on across all these different dimensions next. And Ohio, similar next. Minnesota, huge lifts, again, going up to 179% for a place to start a business if you visit next. And there's North Carolina, again, showing consistent lifts. And then next. And look at New Mexico. Uh, nobody much knows, but if you get people to visit, uh, all of a sudden you think it's a great place to live, start a career, a business, attend college, purchase a vacation home, or to retire. Next. And there's uh, Portland. Next. And finally, Lake Erie Shores and Islands. Um, interestingly, the advertising was having an even bigger impact than visitation for Lake Erie Shores and Islands. The agency must have been doing a great job. Next. So, in summary, next. Um, I just have six more slides to show you that look at the image lift across nine DMOs, summarizing uh, the image lifts for advertising and for visitation. But here we've added one more thing at the bottom. What about the combo effect? What if you both see the ads and you visit? Um, is there a boom effect? Um, well, there is a bit of an explosion. This is across nine DMOs. You can see the uh, for a good place to live, uh, advertising and visitation were in the same general range, but you would double that if, uh, if you accomplish both. Next. And similarly, for a place to start a career. Next. To start a business, the combo is up 194%. Wow. Next to attend college, again, a uh, combo effect. And the vacation home, same thing. 
finally to retire. Yep, um, more than double if uh, you see the ads in both. I mentioned Andy Levine at DCI, uh, one of the gurus of, uh, on the economic development side, when he wrote the initial results up of North Dakota that we showed him on Forbes, he said, while tourism marketing has been shown to generate significant economic impact by driving visitation, these results demonstrate the potential long-term benefits for broader economic development. Next. And uh, another one of our industry bright lights on the tourism side, Bill Geist, who many of you know, said, the jury is in, the verdict is crystal. The visitor-focused advertising of DMOs has a pronounced impact on measures that many community leaders have long said are more important than quotes on quotes tourism. Next. Destination marketing is crucial to showcasing our communities, Geist said to far more than visitors, but indeed to future residents and investors. And now no community leader can honestly argue with that, talking about these research findings. Uh, uh, Governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker, who of course is uh, uh, now running for the Republican leadership, uh, was quoted in the media saying, investing in tourism promotion marketing at the national, state, and local level is not only an effective way to attract visitors and grow the economy, it also enhances the image of the state as a place to live and do business. He said that after seeing our research. Next. So the halo effect in psychology, which I mentioned, um, uh, it was Edward L. Thorndike, a uh, famous early psychologist who, um, in 1920, uh, documented through research uh, this halo effect as a bias, a cognitive bias, in which our judgments of a person's character can be influenced by overall impressions of them. He started out by doing research um, that looked at uh, commanding officers' um, evaluation of soldiers and in terms of uh, their physical properties, uh, such as neatness, voice, physique, etc., their intellect, their leadership, their personal uh, qualities, including uh, cooperation. And uh, uh, anyway, he. Um, uh, looked at the correlation between all of these and, um, well, the correlations he reported weren't as high as what I've seen in this research when for the researchers listening in on here, uh, you would look at uh, the correlation between um, tourism uh, image attributes and economic development attributes, you'll see that there's a very strong correlation uh, between all of them. They tend to be measuring the same thing. I like to say that there's no Chinese wall in the brain that separates out how people see a place, both in terms of a place to visit or a place to live and work. Next. Um, after, and, and more recently, there have been a number of um, articles and publications about the halo effect in marketing. Uh, there's an image I stole from one of them that uh, they always seem to talk about Steve Jobs, the iPod, and what it did to start the Apple revolution and with the halo effect spreading to com computers uh, and telephones, pads, etc. Next. And so finally, uh, I'd like to um, end my part of this by... Uh, <laughs> saying that uh, uh, that's George Zimmerman, if you don't recognize him, by the way, that I think George has, through Pure Michigan, illustrated the halo effect, uh, how it works for both tourism and, and uh, economic development uh, for the brilliant Pure Michigan case. And I think, uh, next slide, George, you wanted to sum up a couple of last thoughts. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Bill. So a couple things. I mean, I think the, the important thing for the, for those on the uh, webinar today as destination marketers, research people, et cetera, is, you know, since most of you in looking through the list are from uh, cities in particular or regions and a few states, um, 
I guess you know when we got this data back and saw the results, which were more than any of us expected, the, the amount of lift. I mean, it, we I always expected there'd be some results, some positive results in the state's image for these uh, economic development objectives by the tourism effort. Um, I, but none of us expected the magnitude that we have that uh, Bill just laid out. And I think that you know the conclusion. Well, including I, me, George, because uh, I've been doing research on uh, both tourism, but also looking at major advertisers with a lot more money, like Procter and Gamble, uh, where we were doing ROI work on three and a half billion dollars worth of advertising expenditures. And I've never seen anything like this, including the consistency of what we're seeing after all these years of doing yep. research. Well, yeah, and I, so I think that's the point. So, so what does this mean for you, for uh, for destination marketers in, in cities, states, regions, etc.? You know, I think that the my, my takeaway from it, once we saw this data and actually could quantify the impact, was, well, first of all, and and remember, the the ads we were the, the impact we were testing, the lift that you saw, were not ads designed to do combo efforts. They weren't, you know, uh, ads promoting both tourism and economic development activity. They were strict tourism campaigns solely tourism campaigns designed to attract visitors, period. And yet they still had this enormous impact on the, the image of a destination by consumers. So I think my takeaways from this are a couple. One, that tourism destination marketing is the brand marketing for most places. And that makes, and this, my second takeaway is, that makes you as the tourism marketing leaders in your communities, the brand managers for your community's marketing efforts for everything. Now, what you do with it and how and how various cities and states and regions will kind of deal with that but but I think that that's you know to me is the kind of the logical next step is is for for the, for the tourism folks to assume the lead as the brand managers for their places they represent for everything and now I will tell you when the, when the economic development people in Michigan said oh yeah we're going to we're going to take your Michigan and make it for business development marketing all that too I mean I will be the first person who will say, honestly say I, was, I had a little trepidation about that um, because both for Travel Michigan and for McCann Detroit, we're going, uh, gee, that's great, but we hope you don't mess it up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it turns out it worked out fine. It was the right thing to do. But, but, so, but, but especially in cities where often, obviously, the CBB function and the city's economic development efforts, uh, unlike many states where they're, they're, that's housed in one agency, for many cities, that's two or three or four different groups doing that kind of work. There's the Bureau, and then there's the DDA, and then there's the Eco Development Corporation, and then there's the city itself or the county or whatever. So I think that's the challenge, in a sense, with this research is how do you use the fact that the tourism marketing is the, is the brand marketing for a place uh, and, and that, those, that you should be the, the brand managers for your destinations? How does that play out in your communities? How do you get that credibility, that respect, the the budget that should go with that that responsibility, all of those things? So I think it you know opens a lot of questions, uh, opens a lot of opportunities, um, and I think at this point we would take some questions. We've got about ten minutes left. The last thing I would point out is on this last slide you'll note there's the web uh, address for Longwoods Longwoods uh, hyphen intl dot com. Bill and I both are our, our web uh, email addresses and everything are listed there if you need them. So that's where you can get a hold of us. But I think uh, for Jim and for Joy, if we've got questions, now would be a good time. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, George and Bill one last time for their participation today. I think it's been a very enlightening webinar for all of us. We do have a lot of questions, so I want to go ahead and dive in. Um, just once again, if you do have questions, the uh, question module on the GoToWebinar is the place to input them. Going back to the beginning of the presentation where you were talking about the Pure Michigan example, and you mentioned uh, the ROI you were able to demonstrate from the advertising campaign and using that to grow your budget. Can you elaborate on the methods used by Longwoods to establish campaign ROI? Bill, I, guess, I think that's you. Yeah, I guess it sounds like a research question. Yep. Uh, looks like me. Um, we do uh, use a methodology that uh, we developed first in 1990, when um, the method that had been used to get an ROI for in, in tourism, but no place else that I've been able to find, was something called the conversion study. And um, it's developed by academics. Uh, it counted everybody who saw an ad and came and had no control to back out and look at the incremental impact. Uh, 
And uh, uh, I had been hired first out of academia by the phone company Bell um, because the president wanted to get at ROI, uh, saying, you know, should we be doubling our advertising, uh, cutting it to zero, we're spending millions of dollars, we're impacting on billions of revenue help. And I got hired as an academic because of my background in experimental design and uh, research to take charge of what was then the largest study of advertising ROI. And um, uh, I was on the panel uh, that uh, killed the conversion study that um, TTRA and uh, U.S. Travel Associate or Department of Commerce rather held and developed a method that combined the best that I could have out of uh, out of traditional advertising research. Um, I've been an ad agency research director uh, tracking study. Uh, combined that with experimental design, added uh, uh, the sale part of it, which is missing in most tracking research, and stole some ideas out of uh, uh, another standard for ROI that P&Gs and GMs of the world called market mix modeling that uses some regression techniques. And if you're really interested, I'll, I'd be happy to talk privately, but it's not the kind of thing that I can explain in a couple of minutes. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we've won a number of top awards, including uh, a David Ogilvy Award, the most prestigious uh, award for advertising research uh, for the Pure Michigan campaign. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we had a lot of questions about basically how do you go about establishing cooperation, how do you approach the economic development groups. Uh, we've even had a number of people ask if if they can get a copy of the presentation deck to share with their economic development organizations. And we will be sharing a, a copy of the recording and the presentation with all attendees in a few business days. But I wondered if you had some recommendations or approaches. Uh, if someone was going to share this, this presentation with their economic development organization, what should their um, approach be and what should their message be when they bring it to that group? You know, one thing I would say is that I do know, and in fact, in talking with uh, Andy, Lo Andy Levine from DCI at uh, at DMAI in Austin, you know, I think one of the, he made a good point, which is, you know, the one thing is that I think that the tourism, the destination marketing folks w would be making a mistake if they saw this as a way to get money from the other group. I think what you want to do is establish yourself as the um, brand leaders for your community, um, and I think that this research helps establish that. It's also something, frankly, Longwoods, we might be able to help you with. So we could talk more about that if it's something you're going to move forward with. But, uh, but I think that's, you know, the, the thrush should be that, you know, look, there's all evidence out there. Could, again, help you, you know, get some evidence specific to your community, uh, potentially, if, and we can talk about that. But there's all this growing evidence out there that the tourism marketing message is the brand message for a city or state or region. And so I, I think approaching them and saying, look, the work we're doing, um, you need to look at it in kind of this new light. It's not just about attract, attracting visitors and convention areas and everything out there, which is great, and that's all positive and, and great for the community. But, it, we're, but there's a much broader role in what we're doing, um, and I would try to enlist them to be supportive of the, the destination marketing efforts um, and the budgets and the priority that destination marketing gets in the community. Um, but I think that it, you just have to be careful not to, you know, because the anything that seems to be threatening to them, I think they'll immediately kind of shut it down and say, you know, stay away, <laughs> keep away from us. Right, don't do a money grab. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good message um, to project. Um, we had a couple of people say that they, that they recently launched a, a big marketing campaign and they want to know, because the campaign has already begun, is it too late to use a firm like Longwood? Uh, to measure the ROI, the ROI of that advertising campaign or to do a similar study measuring the halo effect of that campaign just because it's begun already? Uh, no, it's uh, not. Bill, Bill can give more detail, but the short answer is no because the research is always done after the campaign. Bill, yeah, up, to, up to a couple of months after uh, so that we can, um, because we're measuring conversion uh, in terms of trip taking for the tourism side, uh, we'd like to give people the opportunity to actually take the trip or we won't get any ROI. So we go in anywhere from right after a campaign is run. A lot, we're about to get into a whole bunch of these studies because um, 
majority of our clients do spring summer campaigns and uh, so it's the fall is a, and early winter are busy times for us on ROI. But certainly we can do it. We don't have to go in ahead of time is the main point. Perfect. Uh, this is a question for George. I want to know what, what the tipping point was to get Michigan's Economic Development Group to adopt the Pure Michigan campaign. Was it just a direct order from the governor, or what was it exactly that made them adopt their campaign versus the Economic Development Campaign? Yeah, it really was that the when the Governor Snyder was elected, you know, he had a transition team, which is the typical thing you do with a new administration coming in. And so during that time period, between the election in November and when they took, took office in January, uh, as is typical in many states when you have a change of administration, so all of these new people were coming in and kind of looking, you know, kicking the tires of state government. And so when they got to our department, to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, you know, they basically said, okay, well, present to us kind of what you're doing on both sides, on the, on the business marketing side and on the tourism promotion side. And it was from, and then present, you know, and then provide us the data that shows kind of the effect of what you've done uh, over the last few years. And so really it was kind of a, you know, some fresh sets of eyes looking at those results um, then that they concluded, well, we see what you've been doing. We think the Pure Michigan thing is great. We don't think the upper hand thing is really makes sense to be separate and a separate campaign and separate agency and separate, you know, million, multi-million dollar budget. So we're going to put it all together under Pure Michigan. So it was really that, you know, they came in as the new leaders uh, and said and took a look at the at the campaigns and the creative and the research and said, yeah, that's the way to go. It should be one brand. Okay, and when you were looking at the uh, the halo effect result, and you looked at um, visitation, those who had visited versus those who hadn't, and the the difference in lift, did you do any deeper dive into repeat visitors, how they were affected versus first time visitors? Uh, not in this research, right, Bill? This is strictly kind of what we presented. The the one point I would make though is, and, and Bill mentioned, but I just want to reinforce it. To me, the most amazing, what I would have predicted would have, ha would have happened with this since I came up with these questions was that the key to success would have been to get people to visit. So that you would advertise and then they would visit and that would be the big payoff as far as Lyft if they actually got there. But the surprising result, the most surprising result was that just visiting isn't where the biggest payoff is. The big payoff is people who have both seen the ads and visited. That somehow the the way that they are inspired to, to come to a destination through the creative work of the advertising and then the actual experience of visiting the place, that's the big payoff is having both, which to me goes back to my earlier point about being the brand manager for your destination. You know, it is, the advertising is as crucial as the visitation. It is because it's the pairing of the two that give you the huge lift. And that's why I... I and the uh, lift that we saw for advertising uh, was in the same league, virtually as large across all those six different uh, measures that George came up with as visitation. Correct. That was a huge surprise to me. Yep, yep. So I think that it is because of that, because to me that points to the, the even more important, you know, how important that tourism advertising marketing is to the image of the destination because it's when it's paired with that in visitation that you really get the best impact as far as pe people thinking about your destination in a new way for all of these other things. And another thing that um, was a huge surprise to me um, uh, it was how quickly advertising um, can create the, the sorts of impacts we're talking about including a new campaign and I've seen the many times, but uh, the classic was Pure Michigan when, uh, because it had never gone national, as George said. When they went national the first time, and we actually did a pre and a post um, uh, survey and found that before they had gone in nationally, that uh, compared to its Midwest competition, Michigan was pretty much at the bottom of the list nationally in terms of uh, overall image for tourism destination, a place that people would really want to visit. It moved in six months of advertising nationally from ninth place to second place. And as somebody who came from academia and was very skeptical, uh, I did move to the dark side of marketing, but uh, when I got into tourism and I see the sort of impacts that a good campaign can create, I still have to shake my head and go, wow. 
All right, I think we have time for one last question, and it's, it's going back to the advertising and its effect. Um, you guys did uh, two, two examples, Pure Michigan and then also the state of Wisconsin, who have very different uh, campaign strategies. Pure Michigan is very highlighting the physical attributes and uh, culture of Michigan, whereas Wisconsin really goes with that comedic approach and uses a lot of their airplane TV spots. But both campaigns had positive lift in terms of economic development factors. Do you think that any type of messaging uh, is, is better in the long run to highlight these economic development uh, lifts, or is it really just the tourism advertising in general, building that brand? You know, I'll start building. You can finish. Yeah, so, okay, sure. so the I, I think that you know what the, this shows is because across those nine campaigns uh, and nine destinations, there was a wide range of types and approach and what was emotional and what was more kind of fact based and you know all of those things and so and yet the results were consistently positive. Now I think that you know you probably could drill down with some more you know granular research to you know test you know, more emotional campaigns versus more tactical or retail campaigns or whatever. Uh, and you might be able to come to some conclusions. I don't think that the research we did, you know, in this case on the, on this topic is granular enough to really tell you that. But we did see, but, but the kind of the good news is that, you know, it appears that generally effective tourism marketing has this impact no matter what the kind of the style of the marketing. Bill, I don't know, your, your thoughts. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, I guess what I've learned is a couple of things. One is I've seen campaigns fail, generate zero ROI and no image lift or even uh, backfire and uh, create negative imagery. <laughs> um, so not every campaign uh, uh, simply works because you're, you, you're stimulating eyeballs out there through exposure. And uh, one of the absolute keys I've found um, is if you can hit the emotional hot button, which certainly Pure Michigan does, New Mexico does, and a number of others, um, you're going to get over time the, the best results, both in terms of uh, halo effect, image lift, uh, but ultimately ROI. And um, if I look at uh, what preceded Pure Michigan on the economic development side, it was a pure left brain campaign. Um, and so was uh, the uh, campaign, what was it called again, George? Uh, um, a Great Lakes, uh, whatever it was before. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was so memorable. Great Lakes, Great Times. <laughs> great Lakes, Great Time. Yeah, I mean, it, it still got a low but positive ROI, uh, but it was all. Uh, left brain, come to Michigan, we got lakes, we got casinos, we got uh, trees, we got whatever. And, uh, you know, we work for um, uh, the majority of the states in the region, and uh, they got a lot of the same kind of product. <laughs> they got lakes, <laughs> they have casinos and, and uh, amusement parks and etc. So um, where Pure Michigan, I think, is a great example and why it continues every year to enhance the ROI numbers from where we started is because it goes beyond that literal left brain approach that uh, and, and really drives in emotionally the, the music from the Cider House Rules, Tim Allen's voice, the imagery. Uh, I think that was very, very key. Uh, I'd also point out that Michigan's ROI numbers are um, more conservative than for some of our other clients because they insisted that um, we only um, uh, look at the impact on out-of-state visitors, whereas uh, uh, other uh, campaigns that we evaluate uh, very specifically, they're interested in uh, promoting uh, travel from within, not just uh, externally. So their numbers in Michigan are pretty conservative. But that campaign works why it's the emotional factor. Well, George and Bill, I just want to thank you both once again for taking the time today to, to be with us and share this, 
very informative and exciting research. Um, if we didn't have time to answer your question, don't worry, we'll pass those along to George and Bill. Uh, you can also get in touch with them by visiting the website the URL listed on the slides. Um, I hope everyone found this informative and as we continue to drive the collaboration between the destination marketing world and economic development world, I hope that you will continue to stay engaged. Thank you very much.